Lord, as we gather together today, we invite you to be present among us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. Lord, please fill us with your peace so that as we journey onwards, we would pour out your love and grace to others. We ask that our souls would catch the wind of your spirit so that we would take your promises to all the earth. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning and we just hope and pray that the time you spend with us will strengthen your soul and revitalize your spirit as we move through the days ahead. Now, as you are able, would you please stand and join us in our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King, which is uh, printed in the order of worship. Thank you, and for those standing, you may be seated. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor here at First United Methodist Church of Florence, and we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. God is good, and God is at work in our midst, and that's why we gather together to worship, is in celebration of who God is. If you're visiting with us, we're especially grateful for you tuning in to uh, join us in worship today. And as Emily has already shared with you, we hope that this experience is meaningful and engaging to you in every way that just benefits your walk uh, through this life. As a church, we believe that we exist to offer creative experiences that lead people to inspiring encounters with God, meaningful engagement with each other, and lifelong transformation. And in this congregation, even as we uh, do the, the life of the church remotely, God is continuing to bless us and to, to interact with us, uh, helping us to grow in our relationship. I'm going to invite Terry Stubblefield to come forward and just share briefly about different opportunities for discipleship throughout the week. 
even though we're worshiping online and we thank you for being with us, we want you to be connected to First United Methodist Church of Florence and to each other. We have classes and groups meeting online. We have resources available on multiple platforms for children, for kids, for young people, for adults, and for families. So use these resources for your family to spend time together with each other and with God. We have talented people sharing Bible lessons, worship services, Bible classes, devotionals, even advice for this quarantine season for using the time wisely. And we have meditation and exercise experiences. So consult our website, consult the messenger, call our office for information. Let's stay connected. Thank you, Terry. As Terry said, there's information available on our website, fumcflow.org. And if you go there, you can register your attendance with us today. Or if uh, you just want to uh, make a comment on Facebook, just here or present, uh, to let us know that you're with us today, that would be great. And again, we're so glad that you're with us. We received some news this week. Uh, we had petitioned uh, uh, the uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Services for a visa for Alex Jones, someone that we had selected uh, who is a citizen of England to come and to be our organist here uh, when Linda May finally gets to retire. Um, we received word that that uh, petition has been denied and after consultation uh, with Alex and uh, with uh, the attorneys as well as with the leadership of the church, uh, we have decided that we're going to reactivate the search uh, and seek a new candidate uh, for the position. And we ask that you keep us in your prayers as we go through that long and tedious process once again uh, and pray that, that we can find someone uh, as equally engaging and talented as Alex was. And so, uh, again, we appreciate your prayers uh, during this time. Uh, in my hand, I have a document. It's called Do No Harm, Recommendations for Reopening Our Church Buildings. And this is a document that's been prepared by the North Alabama Conference of the United Methodist Church uh, that is a comprehensive plan for determining how and when uh, we'll gather together again for worship here in this building. Uh, I shared before that uh, uh, currently uh, the bishop has asked us not to worship together prior to June 1st. So unless she extends that, that decree, then uh, it will be June 7th uh, before we're able to worship together. But also understand that there will be togetherness with restrictions. And this uh, document offers some really excellent guidance in, in how to do that. And as we move closer to um, meeting together again, then we'll be happy to share uh, all of this information with you. As a matter of fact, the document was posted to Facebook this week uh, on the Florence First uh, Facebook page, and so you can access it there and see for yourself the guidance uh, that we will follow moving forward. I'm grateful for your faithfulness and generosity in giving. I shared last week that we are experiencing a, a slowdown in giving, and uh, that's to be anticipated the longer that this goes on. Uh, but just receive this as a gentle reminder for those of you who've made a commitment to our church uh, that we're continuing to be in ministry and we're continuing to offer hope uh, in the midst of this pandemic and your gifts are very important to the continuing operation of all that we're doing, as well as setting the foundation for that which we will once again do as we gather together, hopefully in the near future. I want to invite uh, Emily to come forward and to offer our blessing for the offering today. Dear Lord, help us to be generous givers, both of our time and our gifts, so that we might make a difference in our community. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was so that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen.
Please follow me in your thoughts as I pray for this church and for you. And then at the end of this prayer, we can all pray together the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Gracious God, God of mercy and compassion, in these uncertain times, be close to all who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. Be our light, our hope, and our consolation. Bless us with healing and strength. Lead us and guide us. Be with us in our church. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus, which is the foundation of our sure hope of living forever with you. And help us always to pray the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. scripture lesson today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 13 through 22. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is right? But even if you do suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts reverence Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep your conscience clear so that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of, ar of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authority, and power subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. The whole landscape of human interaction is undergoing seismic shifts. We're moving away from the conventional customs of greeting one another like handshakes and hugs to new and awkward forms of contact like fist bumps and elbow taps, that is, if we're even getting close enough to do those things. Face masks have, have become commonplace, and hand washing and sanitizing are recommended precautions every time that we touch someone else or touch something in order to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Think about this. Human beings have been social creatures for at least 40,000 years that we know of. But it wasn't until about 170 years ago that we had any idea that hand washing could be an important factor in our health and our well-being. It's amazing that we sur survived that 39,800 years beforehand. Well, Ignaz Semmelweis was a European doctor who in the early 1840s noticed that at the Vienna General Hospital where he practiced medicine, women who gave birth in the maternity ward where midwives were trained were less likely to die as a result of childbirth than women who gave birth in the other maternity ward where doctors were trained. Semmelweis observed one particular variable that interested him. Whereas the midwives only delivered babies, the doctors frequently performed autopsies and then would immediately go into the maternity ward to attend to a patient. Semmelweis concluded that the doctors were transferring something from the cadavers to the mothers, and he had no idea what it was but he did have an idea about a way that, that they might be able to stop the spread of whatever it was that was happening. He convinced some of the other doctors, along with himself, to wash their hands before attending to any of the maternity patients. And the mortality rate in that maternity ward dropped dramatically. You would assume that his discovery was celebrated and that hand washing would become the standard operating procedure, but yet his results were met with skepticism and doubt. The other doctors argued that his results were inconclusive because he couldn't identify exactly what it was that was being transferred from the cadavers to the women but they were busy people as well, and to stop and to wash their hands in the middle of the day was just something that they didn't have time to do. Semmelweis was ridiculed, ostracized, and eventually driven to perceive madness by the rejection of his peers. He died a tragic death in a mental institution at the age of 47. Ironically, it would just be a few years later, shortly after his death, that Louis Pasteur's work in germ theory identified Semmelweis's observations as a significant contribution to the field of medicine. His hunch about how disease is spread is the foundation for the practice that we're all engaging in so frequently now of washing and sanitizing our hands. Semmelweis's experience mirrors the question that is raised in 1 Peter where it says, now who will harm you 
if you are eager to do what is good? Well, the obvious answer should be that, of course, no one's going to harm you. But there's no guarantee for any of us who choose to do the right thing that we are automatically protected from harm or ridicule or any other type of oppression. Doing good often means challenging the systems and the structures, what the Bible refers to as the powers and principalities that control who has authority and who doesn't. The powers and the principalities will go to great length to hold on to the controls of influence, wealth, and privilege. And God have mercy on those who challenge their dominance. In the text from 1 Peter today, the followers of Jesus are under attack by those with whom they used to worship in the pagan temples. The Christians, upon believing in Jesus, denounced their former practices of worship. Citizens of the empire were expected to worship the pagan gods of the state because these pagan gods supposedly ensured that the empire would prosper and be protected. For the Christians to step away from the worship of the pagan gods was seen as a betrayal. They were seen as failing at patriotism. There was hope that they would fall back in line with the social pressure that was put on them. And although we don't know whether they were really physically harmed or not, we do know that they were definitely marginalized and treated as outcasts. Some Christians succumbed to the pressure. It was those who stood firm in their newfound faith that were targeted for harassment. So the writer of Peter continues in verses 14 and 15, but even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Whoever wrote 1 Peter didn't clarify what he meant by doing what is right. Rather, he left it open for what could be broad interpretation. Some have argued the author was referring to feeding the hungry or sheltering the homeless, which was something that the first century Christians did rather frequently. Although we know some people get irritated when they see others enabling poor people in their opinion, it generally doesn't lead to persecution or oppression and yet the source of oppression and harm that we read about in 1 Peter may be one degree of separation away from that notion of helping the poor. It's true that helping the poor doesn't normally lead to repercussions. However, challenging the systems and the structures that favor the rich and the powerful that will get you crucified. In the Bible, God cries out for justice for the poor and the alien in the land. That's not a popular position to take even today. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, as we celebrated on Palm Sunday just a few short weeks ago, when he was met with the waving of the palm branches and the high drama of the crowd, he was engaging in a protest that caught the eyes of the authorities. His toppling of the tables in the temple and driving out the money changers were acts of defiance against the temple system that was an extension of the Roman oppression at the hands of the Herodians. When we stand with Jesus against the evil systems of repression and dominance, the powers and the principalities that crucified him, well, they may come after us too. 
Even in the face of threat, though, many faithful Christians still stand for justice, and they're willing to pay the price for doing what is right. Peter says the reason that we continue to do the right thing is because we don't have to fear what they fear. They, the power brokers, fear losing privilege, wealth, influence, and security. As followers of Jesus Christ, though, he tells us we have nothing to lose. Throughout his life, Jesus embodied humility and the principle that there's enough for everyone. It's a mentality of abundance grounded in the reality that there really is enough for everyone versus a mentality of scarcity that seeks to hold on to as much as one can for fear of not having enough. Living as Jesus lived is countercultural. So we need to be prepared to explain why we think that living the Jesus way is the best way. First Peter continues, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and with reverence. Well, in case you're wondering how to respond when someone asks you about the source of the hope that is in you, I would say we rehearse it every Sunday, at least a response that you could offer, and that's the Apostles' Creed. It was originally devised to give people a simple way to talk about their faith. And it's still a good way to personally describe and name the God who is the source of our hope. And when we share our hope, though, we must do it with gentleness and reverence, not with judgment or a sense of superiority. We meet the arrogance and the intimidation of those in power with the same humility and compassion that Jesus had, even when they intend to hurt us. First Peter continues, keep your conscience clear so that when you're maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. Philip Yancey, in his book, Disappointment with God, tells a story that was first told by Henry Nouwen, it was of a family that Henry knew in Paraguay. The father, a doctor, spoke out against the military regime there and spoke out against the human rights abuses that he so frequently saw evidence of in his medical practice. He felt like speaking out was the right thing to do. In retribution, the police arrested his teenage son. They tortured him, and they eventually executed him in his prison cell. The doctor's friends wanted to turn the boy's funeral into a mass protest march, but the doctor said no, no, that he had a different idea. Instead of placing his son's body neatly in a casket as is our custom. The father displayed the body just as he found it in the prison cell. Naked, on a blood-soaked mattress, with the evidence, the torture and the beatings that his son had undergone in full you. The father wanted to show the world the injustice and the inhumanity of those evil people who were trying to cling to power at any cost. 
Isn't that what God did at Calvary? The cross, Philip said, that held Jesus' body naked and marked with scars exposed all the violence and injustice of this world. At once, the cross revealed what kind of world we have and what kind of God we have. A world of gross unfairness, a God of sacrificial love. As 1 Peter states, for Christ also suffered, suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. I have to admit to you that this pandemic and the toll that it's taken on the life and health of so many people and families, the strain it's placed on the medical personnel who selflessly minister to the sick, the negative impact that it's had on our national economy, the damage it's doing to our local businesses and particularly to those fellow citizens who are low income, whose lives are being dramatically disrupted. And even the way it's made it more difficult for us to function as a worshiping community. All of this feels like a huge challenge that it's going to take a long time to overcome. Maybe not just months, but possibly even years for us to get back on track. Even when we're able to gather together here in this building again for worship, it's not going to be the same. And I wonder about how it will feel for us to be so distant from one another because community is a benchmark of a healthy church. The interaction and the socialization that we share, it's sharing life together. And, and if we have to, have to keep distant from one another, thinking about ourselves as the body of Christ, what kind of trauma will that inflict on us as the body? So where's our hope? Our hope is in a God who can take what appears like a tragedy and turn it into a triumph. Whether it's a flood that led to the salvation of many, as the reference to Noah in the scripture passage indicates, or the public humiliation and execution of Jesus on the cross, that was reversed by the resurrection. Meaning, God can redeem anything, anything, even a pandemic. And I fully expect that God will do so for us to see as well. First Peter describes the story of Noah and the flood, not as a sign of God's punishment, which that's really interesting to me when you compare the way the story is recorded in Genesis and the way that, that the writer of 1 Peter characterized it. He says, rather, it is a means of salvation, that it, it wasn't punishment, it was a way to salvation. He says, beginning in verse 21, and baptism, which Noah and his family's salvation prefigured, now saves you. 
not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. We see the shift of power from the powers and principalities of the world to the Son of God seated on his throne. Nearly 1,800 years before Ignaz Semmelweis proposed hand-washing as a way to save lives, First Peter declared that what we all need is not to be washed of dirt, but what we need is a heart-washing in which we feel at the core of who we are the love and the mercy of God that it bathes over our heart and empowers us to do the right thing. Baptism isn't for the purpose of cleaning our dirty hearts. It's to refresh and empower us to do good works. The God who loves us emboldens us to do the right thing even in the face of persecution. But in the same way Jesus suffered for doing good, too, we need to be prepared to receive some bumps and bruises as well. Those who are threatened by us may do to us what they did to Jesus. But all we know to do, because we do not fear what they fear, is to do the right thing. And, that tr and trust that God will make it all work out in the end. And if you do, then even now, in the midst of the disruption, in the midst of the conflict about what we should or shouldn't do, in the end, we know that there is no better time for hope than now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you are our hope. Give us wisdom when we need it to discern that which is true and right and good and noble. And give us courage to do the right thing, no matter the cost. But most of all, instill within us the hope that you are at work redeeming all things to the ultimate good that is you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn this morning is How Firm a Foundation. And I invite you to stand and join with us in singing these two stanzas. Thanks be to God. Now may the God who can redeem anything be with you. Comfort your heart 
embolden you in good works and help you to trust that God can redeem anything. Amen. Thank you.